On the 22nd of September, 1939, HMS Beerfish was operating off Horn's Reef when it was attacked and duck charged by German surface units. Spearfish had taken a healthy amount of damage. The vessel was unable to dive, and it only had one electric motor in operation, and its radio communications were temporarily knocked out of action, but the Germans failed to sink the submarine. The Admiralty did not learn about the submarine's condition until the 25th of September, and once they did, they dispatched the second cruiser squadron with six destroyers to escort it to Rosyth, and the home fleet was also placed on guard. The home fleet had a couple of healthy capital ships within it, HMS Ark Royal, HMS Nelson, and HMS Hood. By the 26th of September, Spearfish was in the safe hands of the second cruiser squadron. But the Royal Navy was not yet out of danger, as they were about to learn for the first time what it was like to be attacked in the open ocean by aircraft. The twin-engine Ju-88 bomber was launched from the KG-26th and KG-30th bomber wings. The bombers were equipped with 250 kilogram or 550 pound bombs. The British were caught completely by surprise, and Lewis Bailey aboard Hood recounted what happened next. The bombers struck at Ark Royal, and, although they scored no hits, vast water spouts hit her from our sight. The guns crews on Hood's boat deck, as well as my damage control party, were watching the attack on Ark Royal when a bomb, seemingly the size of a grand piano, fell out of the sun to the south of us towards the boat deck. A few feet short, a frightening explosion alongside opened up the top of the anti-torpedo bulge, and the port lower boom was shredded with splinters. All the hot and cold water pipes in the stoker's bathroom, abreast the explosion, fractured. Hood was struck by a single 550-pound bomb on the port side below L1, which was the forward-most 5.5-inch secondary gun. The damage caused was quite extensive. The 7-inch belt was gouged and pitted, the strips connecting the top of the torpedo bulge to the base of the 12-inch main belt had been ripped away, which resulted in flooding of the torpedo bulge, and all four of the ship's turbine condensers were damaged, with the two port side ones being the worst off. The damage to the condensers nearly caused Hood to lose power to its propulsion system, which would have left it dead in the water, but quick action taken by the ship's engineers allowed the vessel to remain moving under its own power, though at a reduced speed. Lord Haw Haw in Berlin was quick to point out the rather ineffective efforts put up by the British anti-aircraft gunners, and the Royal Navy shared this view, as was stated by Len Williams. So sudden had been the attack, we had not even been able to fire a shot. Captain Glenny immediately broadcast orders that the gun's crews were in future to open fire without waiting for orders. This had been a lesson to us. We were still versed on the peacetime practice procedure where one waited for orders before opening fire on the target. We had gotten off lightly on this occasion, but there was to be no further dallying, and the skipper made this point quite clear. Hood successfully returned to Skepa Flow on the 27th of September, where an inspection was quickly done and repairs to the hull were started. From the 1st of October to the 5th of October, Hood, along with Nelson, ran trials between Skepa Flow and Lock U a couple of times. As a result of these trials on the 5th of October, Admiral Sir Charles Forbes, commander-in-chief of the home fleet, stated retubing of all main condensers advised soon in Hood. Repairs on the condensers had to wait, though, as Germany invaded Norway, and Hood had to patrol off the coast of Norway and in northern British waters. On the 31st of October, 1939, Hood was visited by Winston Churchill, whom at that time was the First Lord of the Admiralty, and he recognized that putting off Hood's condensers repairs could not be ignored for too much longer, as the ship's speed was down to 27 knots. On the 11th of November, Hood was docked at Plymouth, where it underwent minor maintenance and repairs. On the 25th of November, Hood departed Plymouth in order to chase down what was assumed to be a Deutschland-class cruiser, but in reality, Hood was chasing down Scharnhorst and Gneisenau, though no contact between the two forces was made. Hood continued to operate extensively throughout the winter of 1939 and 1940, but on the 21st of February, the Admiralty sent orders that Hood should be refitted and repaired permanently at Malta and the repairs should take no more than 45 days. 
Unfortunately, political tensions with Italy continued to rise, and on the 29th of March, it was decided that rather than getting its condensers repaired at Malta, they would be done at Devonport instead. On the 4th of April, 1940, Hood was finally dry docked at Devonport, where a slight refit occurred, but, most importantly, its condensers were retubed and permanently repaired. By that time, Hood's maximum speed had dropped down to 26 knots, which was 6.5 knots below its designed and proven top speed. Hood would remain in dry dock until the 23rd of May, 1940, when it emerged with its propulsion plant restored back to its pre-bombing condition. Hood operated for a staggering seven months with damaged condensers. Hood had a very rough start in the war, so rough in fact it was the first Royal Navy capital ship to be bombed by a hostile aircraft. Then, due to the sinking of Royal Oak and the mining of Nelson, Hood needed to take up the roles of more capital ships, which prevented it from being repaired in a timely manner. At the end of the day, though the ship was damaged and not operating efficiently, it was still capable of completing the tasks that were given to it. With that having been said, there's nothing more to add on to this topic for today. So, if you have learned something new in this video, why not leave a like and a comment down below, and have a wonderful day.